Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Your husband's downstairs. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, Iman Tariq. Assalamu alaikum, Sanya. How are you? Alhamdulillah, well. Were you at the Ta'lif interview dinner? Yeah. Okay. They missed out. You should have been there. It was okay. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Innal hamdalillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa nastahdih wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم اما بعد السلام عليكم الحمد لله we're still reading the shama'il of imam at-tirmidhi about descriptions and personal affects and lifestyle, etc., of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And as we mentioned at the onset of this class, this is an excellent way to uh, get to know the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And um, I think it's even more uh, special that we're doing so with a pre-modern book, <clears throat> because I think the modern context is one that has thrown everything into craziness, so that when you read, you don't know is somebody responding to criticisms of the Prophet or somebody perhaps um, you know, uh, making a criticism even of the Prophet because that has become such a part of um, our age you know, to read these hadith of the Prophet والسلام, all of them, you know, ancient, right? Um, very old, very authentic. Uh, no question concerning their veracity. Um, kind of gives us a glimpse into how Muslims of the past thought about the Prophet والسلام, how they learned about him, um, you know, uh, the kinds of things that they you know, uh, memorized and, 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 and practiced uh, as a result of those things being associated with him. So we have come to chapter 30. And believe it or not, we are on Hadith 197. Wow, we've done, you know, it's, it's, a, it's amazing how just gradually moving just a little bit by a little. Shay'an fashay'an, shay'an fashay'an. You can make very steady progress. Right, just with consistency. So we are on Babu Maja'a fi Sifati Fakihati Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What has been narrated concerning the description of the fruits of the Messenger of Allah, Alayhi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What fruit did he like? Now, it's interesting that, you know, many people will tell you 65 maybe percent of the Prophet's diet was dates different kinds of dates, tamar, balah, different, you know, dates at different stages of ripening. Um, in addition to that, he ate lots of grain, he ate lots of fruits. Um, he hardly ever ate meat, right? Although he spoke, as we read in previous chapters, he spoke in praise of meat. This is Sayyid al-Ta'am, this is the, the best of food, etc. But he himself, did not eat prodigious amounts of meat only because meat was scarce, right? People in the, you know, people would, I mean, even now, people who, um, you know, harvest animals and slaughter them and eat them, they usually do so rather sparingly. Uh, 
they might be surprised to learn that some of us eat meat every meal, right? Bacon with the breakfast, turkey sandwich, you know, you know, lamb chops for dinner. You know, that might be like shocking. Amir's like, no, no, keep eating the meat, keep eating, keep eating the meat, and just make sure you order from Billy Dog. <laughs> right? But um, so he says. عن عبد الله ابن جعفر قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يأكل القثاء ورطب. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on the authority of Abdullah ibn Jafar who reported the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would eat cucumber with fresh dates. رطب is fresh dates. So with dates there's so many. You know they say that كثرة الأسماء تدل or كثرة الأسماء تدل على الشرف أو ال يعني اهتمام. That when something has a lot of names, it indicates that that thing is either um, very important to people. So if you look at all, if you look, if you think about something that has many names. It indicates that that thing is very important because people call it by many names. They say money, they say bread, they say dough, they say cheese, they say fatty, they say brethren, they say, you know, it has many names that's indicative of the importance of money, right? Dinero, right? I mean, many names, right? And everybody knows what you're referring to. Similarly, if something has a lot of names, it's an indication of kind of how, how noble that, that thing is, right? That it has a role in everyone's life. You know, dates for the Arabs, there are many names and many types from Tamar to Rutab to Balah to like, there's like 50 names for different types of dates, right? It's almost unimaginable, right? But here he says the Prophet والسلام, would eat cucumber with fresh dates. And for him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that was a meal, fresh cucumber and dates, right? For us, that would be, uh, that would be a very sparse meal. You know, we might consider that an appetizer. Some of us only use cucumbers to, you know, to put in our salads or maybe to infuse our water or something like that. But that was a meal for the Prophet so Cucumbers, fresh dates, that's a meal. <laughs> عن عائشة رضي الله عنها أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يأكل البطيخ والرطب. Aisha reported that the Prophet عليه وسلم would eat watermelon with fresh dates. You know, Subhanallah. I was, I was, I was in Egypt, and I was, um, you know. My teacher that I used to read Quran with, his name was Sheikh Sayyid Hamid Mahmoud. And he lived, I have to get in contact with Sheikh Sayyid, but um, he lives, inshallah, ta'ala umrah, may Allah lengthen his years, uh, in, in an area called the Rasa, or um, it's an area close to Azhar, right? Or, or we call it Hussein, it's close to Azhar. And uh, Sheikh Sayyid was born blind, right? So he was never, it wasn't that he, he could see and then he lost his sight. You know, he was born blind. And he was the hafiz of the Quran and he recited Ashur al Qiraat, 10 different modes of recitation. And I swear, it seemed as though the only English word he knew was no. Whenever I would recite to him, no, no. <laughs> If the haboak, open your mouth, right? No, 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 no. That's all he would say is no. Um, but <clears throat> I can tell you funny Sheikh Sayyid stories all night. The first thing about Sheikh Sayyid is that he would drink tea incessantly, cup after, and he would drink arusa. Cup after cup after cup after cup. You know, I would say to myself, do you ever stop drinking? Like, you know, only on Ramadan, right? But if it wasn't, if he wasn't fasting, tea, tea. And his son Muhammad would just bring tea, 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 just 
all the time. And he would always say when I came into the house, I give luck shay. I would always say, no, no, I'm fine. Right? And the last up, yani. Right. Well, I would say shit up, I already had, I already drank something. And once he said to me, he said, every time I offer you tea, you reject my tea. Is there something wrong with my tea? Is my tea not good enough for an American? American, what, what, what kind of tea do I have to have for you to drink some? And I said, no, it's not. It's not that um, your tea is not good enough for me. I actually don't drink coffee or tea. And he said, why not? What, almost as if, like, what good can there be in life without drinking tea? <laughs> right? Like, why not? And I said, أخاف على أسناني. I'm afraid for my teeth. Now, Sheikh Sayyid, his teeth, I love this man. And he was very handsome. His teeth were completely rotten, right? He was blind. And he probably didn't realize that the tea had uh, rot. Uh, I mean, they, his tea, I mean, because he drank so much sugar in his tea that his teeth were destroyed. All of them were rotten. Every, every tooth that you could see when he smiled was rotten. Many of them had, 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 had fallen out. And um, he looked at me and he said, you don't drink tea to preserve your teeth? He said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. He said, I drink tea every day and my teeth are beautiful. <laughs> you know, and I was just like, mashallah, uh, yeah, you know, bring me bring me one tea, inshallah. I drink, I drink a tea with him that day. Uh, something else about Sheikh Sayyid that, that you know, I remember fondly was that sometimes I would just be in the area and I just wanted to see him, right? So I would, no manners, I would just show up at his door unannounced, right? I would just knock on the door. And every time he opened the door, he would say, Sheikh Bailillah, salam alaykum. He would just know he would know it was me. And I would say, how, how do you like how do you know? And he would just laugh. <laughs> I know. And I would just think, how, you know, like how, like how can you, how do you know it's me? And so one day I showed up unannounced. He opened the door, salam alaikum, obey the left. And I and I just asked him, I said, Sheikh, you have to tell me, how do you know that it's me? He said, I sit by my window. And he said, everybody who comes into my apartment, because he lives on the second floor, he said they have a very distinct gait. He's blind. He said that you take the first two steps very quickly. The middle steps, you slow down. And the last two, very quickly. And then you kind of drag your feet to the door. And the knock is one, two, three. That's how I know it's you. He said, I actually know the gate, how they ascend the staircase, and the knock of everybody who comes to my house. SubhanAllah. <laughs> you know, said, SubhanAllah. You know, like, فقدان الحاسر. He had lost the sense, but he was a very, very perceptive, you know, very, very perceptive man. So one day he was asking me about life in America. And I was explaining to him about racism. I was explaining racism and... and I, I don't know why, maybe I had just seen these cartoons myself. I said, but you even have racism that has seeped into like, like cartoons and images that are shown to children. And he said, how can you put a, a racist idea in a cartoon? And I said, uh, so they may show like black children, their faces pitch black, big white smiles, their faces buried in watermelons. And he looked and he said, is there something wrong with eating watermelon? <laughs> and a you know, he's like, you know, I love watermelon. And the Prophet وسلم, used to eat watermelon. And I was like, Sheikh, that's not the point. That's not, you just, that's not, that's not the point of the story. But even when I was leaving, he was like, I can't believe somebody would make fun of somebody for liking watermelon. Watermelon is the, the most, it's the, it's the it's the most beautiful fruit there is. I love watermelon. Right? So every time I come to this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that Aisha narrated, and the Nabiya, and the Nabiya, so I said, Kana yakul dutiha, wa rutub, bil rutub. 
that the Prophet ﷺ would eat watermelon with fresh dates. I think about him. You know, I think about Sheikh Sayyid. And one more story for the room. One more story for the room. One more story for the room. Where he lived, there were no paved, no sidewalks, no paved roads. Right. And I had a pair of loafers that I would wear like some, like some driving moccasins. But I didn't want to like wear them down by wearing them in mud. So when I was going to my lesson, I would get to the edge of where his village started and I would take my shoes, the loafers I had, I would take those off, throw those in my bag, and then I would put on a pair of old sneakers and just you know walk through, you know, what was essentially a slum. And after a while, people started to gather to watch me do this. I was like, watch this, watch this. Like, watch this. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. And I would get off the bus. I would change my shoes, those shoes, and just walk through the thing. So Sheikh said, once I got to his house, and he said, tell me if it's true. <laughs> and I don't know what he was going to say, right? So didn't he, tell me, tell me the truth. He said, do you walk around? with three, four, five pair of shoes on you that you can just change them for different events and stuff like that? And I said, no, no I don't, you know, I, I just carry a pair, you know. And he said, mm -hmm. He said, Americans are the most spoiled people. <laughs> he just said, you guys have extra shoes that you carry with you that you change into for different he was like, yeah. You know, he, just, he couldn't believe that. He, he, couldn't, he, he, he found that unbelievable. It was something very, very simple. MashaAllah. Hafidhullah. May Allah preserve him. An Anas ibn Malikin called Ra'aytu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yajma'u bain al. What's that? Khirbiz wa rutab. He said, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, who reported, I saw the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, combine yellow melon with fresh dates. You see in all of these, he's combining with dates. <laughs> so first cucumber with dates. Watermelon with dates. Um, and now we have honeydew melon or yellow melon with dates, right? عن عائشة رضي الله عنها أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أكل البطيخة بالرطب On the authority of Aisha who reported once again the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم ate watermelon with fresh dates again, always eating dates, dates. and it's, it's I, I, you know it's funny man before I converted to Islam I don't think I had ever eaten a date yeah, I had, I had never eaten a date. In fact, the first time I saw a date, I thought it was a fig, right? And I saw like Muslims eating them for iftar and somebody passed me a few and I was like, are these like enlarged raisins or what, you know, what, what am I supposed to, you know, they're like, it's, it's a date, it's a date. And I said, okay, you know, and it's amazing that now dates are very popular. You know, every juice bar, uh, dates, some people consider them a superfood. Dates are very popular. People consume dates, you know, uh, everywhere, all the time. Uh, but when I, when I first embraced Islam, it was like, dates, who, eat, who eats these, right? Uh, this was a staple in the diet of the Prophet, <clears throat> Let me see that. So we have here, عن أبي هريرة قال كان الناس إذا رأوا أول الثمر جاءوا به جاءوا به إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فإذا أخذه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال اللهم بارك لنا في ثمارنا وبارك لنا في مدينتنا وبارك لنا في صاع صاعنا وفي مد في مدنا اللهم إن إبراهيم عبدك وخليلك ونبيك وإني عبدك ونبيك وإنه دعاك لمكة وإني أدعوك للمدينة بمثل ما دعاك به لمكة ومثله معه قال ثم يدعو أصغر وليد يراه فيعطيه ذلك الثمر ما شاء الله beautiful حديث beautiful beautiful حديث very significant حديث 
on the authority of Aisha, who reported, no, on the authority of Abu Huraira, who reported, when people would see the new fruits of the harvest, they would bring them to the Messenger of Allah, When the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would take the fruit, he would pray, he would supplicate, O oh Allah, bless our fruit, bless our Medina, and bless our sa'a, which is a measure, right? <clears throat> and our mud, which is a smaller measure. O oh Allah, verily Ibrahim is your servant and your intimate friend, your Khalil, and your prophet. And I am your servant and your prophet. He prayed to you for Mecca, and I'm praying to you for Medina, with the likes of which he prayed to you regarding Mecca, and the likes thereof along with it. Then he would call for the youngest child he saw, and he would give him some of that fruit. MashaAllah, very beautiful hadith. Uh, the Prophet والسلام, whenever the, the first fruit of the season was harvested, they would bring him some. Um, and they wanted him to taste the fruit and they wanted him to pray for them. And this was one of the um, regular practices of the companions is that they wanted the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. They wanted him to pray for them. So when uh, they came to him, he would first pray for their harvest, that it would be a good harvest. You know, there's a, a very, I think a very illuminating hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that um, once he saw someone cross-pollinating dates, right? And the practice just struck him as strange. Like it was some kind of farming technique. Uh, that they used when they were in fear of the harvest not being plentiful. And the Prophet ﷺ, he saw it and he kind of frowned. So they asked him, they said, is there something wrong with this? And he said, mm, I don't like it, right? And some people say that it was his preference that things be left in their natural state. He said, I, I don't like it. And so, when the and so they refrained from doing it. When they harvested the fruit, it was a terrible harvest. You know, it was the, the yield which was much lower than what they expected. So they came back to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, we did what you told us to do. And it turned out horribly. And he said, you know more than I do about your worldly affairs, right? I don't, I was just, I was just offering a suggestion, but what I said was not something from revelation. And, you know, um, many people, Based on this hadith, uh, and this is kind of a, a very serious intellectual idea, they talk about the, 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 the proper place of the secular in Islam, that not everything is related to revelation. If we're looking at traffic laws, do we need Islamic traffic laws? No, we, we, we empirically determine what laws will move traffic most efficiently and preserve life. You know, some people say, you know, other than specific rulings and injunctions like against, you know, usury and things like that, we don't even need like Islamic economics. These are places where we're looking for practicality, effectiveness, efficiency, right? And to a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum, you know more about your, the affairs of your dunya than I do, right? Not everything is religious, right? Not everything is related to religion. There are some things where the criteria that we use in judging them is not, is this pleasing to Allah? Well, we want everything we do to be pleasing to Allah. But the criteria that we use are, does this serve the goal most effectively? Is this, you know, it's like, what laws, what policies do we need as an organization to move uh, more, you know, to, to, to move toward our collective mission? And, you know, a, a person that enters that space shouldn't feel that they can shut everybody down just by quoting a verse of the Quran. It's like, well, that's not the, that's not the point here. We're talking about, you know, the most effective ways of harvesting dates. And the Prophet ﷺ gave people license to determine that for themselves, right? Um, but when they harvested, they would bring him the fruit and he prayed for that, that fruit. Then he prayed to Allah Ta'ala for their measures, the sa'a and the mud. Now, 
<clears throat> the reason he prayed for those measures was that in um, traditional societies, one of the easiest ways to cheat people and despoil them of their goods was through faulty weights and measures, being, you know, trickery through weights and measures that, you know, you get grain and you put, you know, grain on this side of the scale and then you put, you know, a pound weight, but it's not really, you shaved it some, it's not actually a pound, it's more like three quarters of a pound on this side. People do this kinds of stuff in traditional markets all the time. Right. One of the things that the, the early Medanese community would do is that they actually didn't measure by like those kind of formal weights for small measurements. They would measure by things like uh, a fa'a or a mudu, which is like a fa'a was like a, a certain canister. So you wouldn't have to weigh it up. They would just say two canisters, three canisters, four canisters, five canisters, because it made for greater transparency. It was something that everybody could see and it was clear. Or they would say a mud, which was like two handfuls. So you could just very easily scoop, scoop, that's a mud. Right? A saa is like a one bushel, like one bushel. Now, <clears throat> the reason for this is that what the Prophet وسلم, forbade in business was just a lack of transparency. You know, what the Prophet wanted to keep conflict and to keep disagreement uh, at a minimum is that the seller knows exactly what they're selling and the buyer knows exactly what he's buying and there's no discrepancy with regard to that. That is considered good transparent business. I know what I'm getting and you know uh, what I'm offering. That's the same thing, but you get my drift. I, I was afraid I was gonna mess that up, but both parties are absolutely clear on what's being bought and what's being sold, right? This is one of the reasons that insurance, tetmin, in traditional articulations of Islamic law, insurance was always regarded with uh, great suspicion because the person being insured, of course, they didn't know if they were going to make use of their policy. So if nothing, if the, if the house never burns down or we never experience that natural disaster, then the money doesn't have, it doesn't, you don't get the same thing that you would get if you do have a natural disaster or if the house does catch on fire, right? Um, um, <clears throat> but in contemporary society, I mean, these kinds of insurance are almost a necessity because we all live above our means. You know, if, if my house did burn down, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to just replace it with the money in my pocket. You know, we're a debt, we're a debt-based society. You know, if I, if I did smash into someone's car, I don't have the money on hand to pay for the repairs, depending on how severe the collision was. Um, I mean, one would be a fool to pay for healthcare out of pocket in this, you know, in this, in this economy. So even though um, traditionally, you know, insurance was regarded with great suspicion, Many people say now, I mean, you don't really have a, you know, you don't really have a choice. Uh, and then the Prophet ﷺ began likening his relationship to Mecca, to the relationship of Ibrahim or Abraham, to his relationship to Medina, excuse me, to the relationship of Abraham to Mecca. Now, Ibrahim uh, ﷺ, we know that he left Ismail in the dominant opinion. Some people say it could have been uh, Ishaq, but the dominant opinion is Ismail uh, and Hajra in Mecca and it was a barren valley, right? It was a barren valley, very little vegetation, very little uh, habitation, right? They, they didn't have a lot of people, didn't have a lot of food, didn't have a lot of grains. Um, and he prayed that Allah Ta'ala would make this place not only habitable, for his family, but that the hearts of the people there would incline to his family. And it reminds you of the, the prayer of the Prophet ﷺ is, um, Oh Allah, anta, ya Allah, anta, uh, what is it? Sahibi fi safr wal khalifa fil ahl. 
that Allah, you are my companion as I travel and I entrust my family to you. Right? Bismillahi Allah tawakkalt. In the name of Allah, on Allah I rely. And um, of course, we know that uh, Hajra, while fretting for the security and the, 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 the wellness of Ismail, she discovered Zamzam, right? And this was the beginning of, um, because in traditional societies, people would come where there was water. So the discovery of Zamzam prompted the growth of Mecca as a township, as a place that people wanted to come and settle and live, right? So the dua of Ibrahim from Mecca was answered through Zamzam, right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, in the way that Ibrahim prayed for Mecca, I'm praying for Medina. And there's a very lively but playful discussion among the scholars, what place is superior, right? Mecca or Medina? Mecca or Medina. People that say Mecca, they say the Haram is there. Of course, right? The Kaaba is there. People that say Medina, they say the Prophet, والسلام, his body is there. Right? Medina also has a Haram. And then there's a third opinion that you can't say out loud. The Muslims want to kill you. Some people say Al-Quds. Al-Quds is, you know, uh, a, place, a place of great, you know, and this is not, you won't see this among scholars, but people have confided to me that Jerusalem is a place of great, uh, it, it radiates with a kind of spiritual energy that, you know, you can feel when you visit. Like, it's like, whoa, it's, it's, it's something that's like palpable. Right, this, I mean, you know, in terms of uh, the spiritual significance of Beit al Maqdis, of Al Quds, right, the spiritual significance of, of, of that place, right? Um, but the Prophet والسلام, in this hadith is saying that in the way that Ibrahim is synonymous with Mecca, I am synonymous with Medina, right? It's Medina to Nabi. In the way that Ibrahim is associated with Mecca, I am associated with Medina, right? Um, and then at the end of this hadith, it says that the Prophet ﷺ would call, now, 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 now pay attention to this, he would call the youngest child that he saw, and he would tell that child to take from the fruit, right? SubhanAllah. Right, subhanAllah. You know, the Prophet, والسلام, he had a very special love for children. Right. And any uh, community, any family that does not take advantage of the uh, special spiritual rank of children is depriving itself of a great opportunity. Right. Children have an immense rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why, you know, whenever we're making dua, we tell our children, Najashi, make dua. Najashi, say I mean. Say Makita, say I mean. Make dua, right? Because they're pure. Children are pure, right? They're not mukallaf. They don't have any moral responsibility, right? So their state is one of wonder. It's one of innocence. Sometimes it's hard to believe that when they're tearing up your kitchen, but it's one of wonder, it's one of innocence, uh, and inherent closeness to God, not closeness to God that expresses itself through theology and scripture, inherent closeness to God, right? So the Prophet, والسلام, in order to ensure the blessedness of the harvest, the first person he wanted to eat from the harvest was the youngest child that he could find. You, come in, right? Very important, right? You know, a lot of us, many of us are not farmers, but we do work and we want blessing in our money in the same way they want it blessed in their harvest. So what if taking from this hadith, the first thing that we did when we got paid was buy something for our nephew or our niece or our children, not something, the Prophet didn't give the child the entire harvest, but he just wanted him to take from it first. Here, you take from this first. 
You be the first one among us to eat from this fruit, right? To ensure its blessedness. MashaAllah. Bismillah. <coughs> عن الربيع بنت معوذ ابن عفراء قالت بعثني معاذ بقناع من رتب وعليه أجر من قثاء ظغب وكان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يحب القثاء فأتيته بي وعنده حلية قد قدمت عليه من البحرين فَمَلَأَ يَدَهُ مِنْهَا فَأَعْطَانِي On the authority of Rubay, oh, Rubayy, I, I, I said Rubayy, but the name is Rubayy, Rubayy, Bint Al-Mu'awwidh Ibn Afra, who reported Mu'adh, sent me with a tray full of fresh dates with small cucumbers piled on top. The Prophet وسلم, liked cucumber, so I brought it to him. He had some jewelry that was presented to him from Bahrain, so he took a handful of it and gave it to me. SubhanAllah, what, what a bargain. So, so this, this, this young, this young um, woman, um, named Rubayya. She was sent by uh, Mu'ad, right, to um, Mu'ad ibn Jabal to bring the Prophet والسلام, some fruits that he liked, right? So th there were um, some fresh dates, Murtab, and then there were some sliced cucumbers on the top of the dates. And he just said to her, take this to the Prophet والسلام, just as a gift, right? She said that when I arrived with the tray of dates and cucumbers, I noticed that the Prophet ﷺ had some jewelry from Bahrain. The country Bahrain now, that was a region even before it was a state. And when I gave him the dates and the cucumbers, he just reached into the jewelry and just gave me a handful. Subhanallah. What a, I mean, subhanallah. You know, when you think about Someone, you know, they say that the Prophet والسلام, Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, if it weren't for the la in la ilaha illallah, the Prophet never would have said no. He never, it wasn't for the no, and there's no God but Allah, he never would have said no. She described his generosity as like a rihun mursala, like a free flowing wind. Whenever I come to this hadith, I think, you know that someone is generous when they can give without ceremony, right? He didn't say like, this is for you, my daughter. This is very special. Do you know what this is? He just, she said that I gave him the dates and he just reached into the door and said, yeah. <laughs> so, here you go, right? And <clears throat> they say that, that, that uh, mukafa'ah or giving in exchange was a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Anybody who gave him something, he would give them something in exchange. If, they, if somebody gave him something, he would offer something in exchange. Now, we don't have to do that. It's okay to accept a gift. I think the Prophet ﷺ wanted to go out of his way to establish to everyone that his position was not a position of exploitation. And it's not that you just give me things. And it's like that, that, that my position here is that I'm pampered and I'm spoiled and I'm... Uh, people give me things. And you no, know, I think his sunnah was one of mukafa. If you gave him a gift, he would give you one. Right? He wanted there to be tabadul exchange. If you give me something, I'll give you something. Right? Many times people would offer to give him things. He would insist upon paying. Right? No free sabilillah. Can you give it to me? Free sabilillah. Free sabilillah. Right? And we have this bad. We have this, I mean, maybe we don't, but I do. Astaghfirullah. I do. You know, we enter um, the businesses and the establishments of Muslims. And when they quote for us a price, we give them a hassle. We feel like that musawama, that, that bargaining is just, 
It's something that we have to do. So if he says 20, we say, oh, come on, can, 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 you, can, you, can you do it for 15? If he says, okay, 15, as a matter of fact, can you do it for 12? Lillah, lillah, for Allah, lillah, for Allah, for Allah. The thing about that that's crazy is that when you go to any of your favorite retailers, you go right to the register, whatever the price is, you reach down into your pocket and you just pay it. You just pay it. If they say 250, 70, there's been a price increase, you know, supply chain issues, shortages. You say, last week this was 250, now it's 290 now. Oh, you, you pull the credit card, right? I guess it's 290. You're smiling. Here you go. But when you go to your sister's bakery and she rings you up and she says, that's gonna be 3701. 37? Subhanallah, 37, 37, can I get it for 30? I mean, Subhanallah, I mean, auntie, we're just, we're just trying to make it. Just like, you know, it's like, wait, wait, hold on. You know, I'll tell you guys a funny story. Funny story, man. I used to be a, a little, I used to be a small vendor. I used to be a small vendor. I used to buy clothes and stuff like that. And the guys I would buy from were Palestinian. And I would buy in bulk, you know, I would buy in bulk. And I thought they were giving me a good price. <laughs> Until one day, and you know, and, and of course, as they would buy, as I was paying, they would make it do I for me. And they're speaking, at that time I spoke a little pidgin Arabic, they're speaking little Arabic phrases here and there. And I, the whole experience was just like, mashallah. Right. So one day on my way out, I saw another guy who didn't appear to be Muslim. And I just struck up a conversation with him. And I said, uh, who do you who do you shop with here? And he said the name of my Muslim friend. I said, oh, I said, what do you get? And he was buying the same things that I was. And I said, what do you pay? And he said, half the price that I pay. And so I said. There has to be some explanation. How much do you buy? He bought less than me. <laughs> but I thought maybe he's buying double, triple what I'm, the amount I'm buying. So they're, you know, they're justifying it and cutting the cost. He bought less than me. So when I went back, I said, ah, you, sell, you sell to me at, at, at a higher price than other people? And he said, nah, yes. I said, why would you do that? He said, because they're not Muslim. They don't care if I make good profit. I thought you did. <laughs> They're not Muslim. You think they care if I if, if I do well? They don't care about me. I thought you cared. He turned the entire thing around. I thought you cared about me. So I thought if I charged you a little more, it would, then I made do I that Allah will put the baraka in it. We we both win. And I was like, no, no, I, I want the, I want the price that I want to, I want that I want that price. He was like, you do? I said, I want that price. He said, khalas, yani, khalas, khalas, khalas. And he, gave, you know, and, he, and he gave me my money back. But I was just like, this is reflective of our treatment of each other, right? We do much better by people that are not from our community, right? You know, it's almost like uh, if some, if, again, I, on many occasions, I myself, I'm not talking about any of you. I'm not talking about any of you. I'm talking about myself. I go into a Muslim-owned business and it's like, I want to haggle about the price. Oh. But when you go downtown and you go to Neiman Marcus, you don't haggle about the price. You go to Ralph Lauren, you don't, you don't, haggle, you don't haggle them about the price. You just put the money on shit. Here you go. No, this, this, isn't, this isn't right. This isn't right. No, I mean some places. Some places bargaining is the culture. But they will jack up the price just because they think they're tourists. Oh yeah, I mean. Oh no, no, no! I mean, it, it it goes both ways. I mean, 
you know, who am I They want to, they want to, they want to, they want to, they want to take advantage. I mean, you know, I, I was actually in Egypt before uh, taxi had meters. When you would just yell out where you were going, I bet say, and it was, just, and the price was known. People know this is 10, this is 10 Guinea. We know this is Guinea, we know this. But if he made conversation with you and you, and you appeared not to be Egyptian, it's 20. Or twenty five, right? And and but you but you, but you know the thing about those vendors that always made me admire them a little bit is that I used to be a vendor and don't get and, and I I've, I've even talked to Ulama about what is exploitation and what is changing your price according to a market. So I had products that I could sell in Chicago for seventy five dollars, seventy dollars. I could take those same products to Indianapolis and sell them for $125 because they didn't have access. It was in Chicago, there was so much right there. And I would say, is this exploitation? And my teachers would tell me, no. Not if there's a real price for Chicago and a real price for Indianapolis. Right? If you are altering the price on the spot based on some assessment you've made of the person, then it's exploitation. If the price is really 75 and you're looking at him you're listening to him and you think i can take him for more than that i can i can take him for more than that let's, let's 150. now you're, you're getting into a, a gray area if you really change the price right for everybody in chicago and you change the price for everybody in indianapolis and that's different right but <clears throat> what i'm talking about is just how you know, I guess familiarity breeds contempt or something like that. When you when you know that we're all Muslim, now you want to you want to bargain, right? But we don't bargain with anybody else. You know, in fact, in other places, at least here in, in America, if, if you attempted to bargain, they would look at you like, what? You know, you know, I, I, you know. I had spent so much time in Egypt where bargaining was just the order of the day, almost anywhere you could bargain. I mean, in malls, we, we used to go to City Stars Mall, we would bargain. It was everywhere. It was every, everywhere we're bargaining, everywhere. And I was in a store and I went to the register and I said, is this the best you can do? And they looked at me like, yeah. <laughs> is this the best you can do? What were you expecting? I was hoping to get three for 20. I'm sorry, sir, the price is 15 a piece. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I don't know. But in this, in this hadith, the Prophet, she gave him dates with cucumbers, and he just gave her a handful of jewelry. And we're talking gold, precious gems, a handful. Here, take this, right? Also, she was very young at the time. Um, so she probably wouldn't even have known what to do with such you know uh, precious jewelry but this was just how the prophet was in his generosity like a free-flowing wind and especially to children to young people so this was a young girl that had come to give him um something from her father right take these uh, dates this is for the prophet and in exchange he gave her jewels gold rubies diamond here take this MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. This, this is the same hadith. She said, I came to the Prophet carrying a tray full of fresh dates with small cucumbers piled on top, and he gave me a handful of gold. Good, good cucumbers. <laughs> good, good cucumbers that day. And also, too, um, you know. The other thing that we have to remember about this hadith, and this is just this is just me thinking thinking aloud, is that sometimes in our spiritual ambition, we can forget that these very simple gestures mean things to people, man. You know, some people might think, I mean, I'm I'm so spiritual, I'm so averse to indulgence in the dunya. I don't care about jewelry. I don't care about gold. I don't I don't care about stuff like that. I get it. And the Prophet, I trust me, you were not more averse to indulgence than he was. 
But those things still mean a lot to other people. You'll never read a hadith about the Prophet ﷺ himself hoarding jewelry, hoarding gold. This is for me. And he had a chest in his home that was filled with precious stones. And, but to give this to other people, it's something that they remember. That's why she's narrating this hadith. She remembered that. And I gave him cucumbers and dates. He gave me a handful of gold. Right. So sometimes I've, <clears throat> mashallah, I've observed people that, mashallah, they're comfortable, but they really don't obsess over dunya. Um, they keep some nice things just so they can give them to other people. Right. People come to visit them. They give them here. This is a gift for you. This is a gift for you. And they look and say, but you don't even have a watch. You're giving me this watch. No, no. But I know that I know that people like these watches. They tell me this. They tell me, I thought you would like this, right? So it's like, you can't be so spiritual that you become inattentive to things that are meaningful to other people. You might think, I don't care anything about that stuff. Stuff means nothing to me. That doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything to her. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything to him. You might mean nothing to you. That just may be where you are spiritually. It means nothing to me. I don't care, gold, platinum, I don't care. But to your granddaughter or your sister, your brother, your mother, your, it might mean a lot to them. You know, it might mean a lot to them. MashaAllah. Next chapter. Babu ma ja'a fi sifati shurabi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An Aisha ta radiyallahu anha qalat kanu habbu shurabi ila rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al hulwa on the authority of Aisha, who reported the most beloved drinks to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, were those sweet and cool. Prophet likes sweet and cool drinks. You know, um, a friend of mine uh, <clears throat> told me a story that his cousin became Muslim because she saw him drinking and he was drinking in the manner of taking three sips, like the Prophet And it struck her so strange that she said, why are you drinking like that? And he started talking to her about Islam. And they ended up talking for three hours and after the conversation, she embraced Islam. SubhanAllah. And he always would say, this started just this small practice of, you know, drinking. Now, some people, now I'm gonna make fun of some people. Some people do it in a very obvious way, like, watch this. This is sunnah. <laughs> you know, I mean, whenever I see that, I'm like, I don't know if he did it like that. You know, some people do this very clearly, like, this is, you know, there are those things that people do. And I'm not questioning their sincerity. But when they do them, it does seem like, hey, watch this. This is sunnah. You know, like, when somebody gets a drink of water and they go... Hold on. All right, let's go. It's like, mashallah. We, you love the Prophet, as we can see. <laughs> as we can see. You love the Prophet, as we can see. You know, or, um, you know, some people it's like, no matter what they're eating, they have to eat with their right hand and their middle finger, their index finger. They'd be eating soup like that. <laughs> MashaAllah. You love the Prophet Sasha. Alhamdulillah. Right. So some people they get the they get the cup and they take the three quick sips, like, like did you actually drink any or did you just make a sound? <laughs> What the, the, the context of that hadith, there was a man, he was very thirsty. And he was drinking from a kirba, which is like a water skin, not like a cup. And he had skin in the air and he was drinking. And maybe like you see like athletes, the water was coming out of the side of his mouth. It was falling onto his shirt. You know, it just wasn't a good look. You know, it's, it's funny, man. As a kid, I used to play sports and I used to love to drink like that. Like I used to love to come to the sideline, get the Gatorade and toss it to where it is. 
most of, much of the Gatorade got on my shirt. It just, I, it just felt like a, like an athlete thing to do. You know, it just felt like, you know, you're tired, you're sweaty. <sighs> and it just, it just gets all over your mouth and all over your shirt. And you just feel like, yeah, now I'm like a real, you know, um, the other thing that the prophet, at least I was saying, did not like, don't breathe in the vessel. Don't breathe in the cup. Like, you know, Right. Don't read in the cup. So what 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 he said was, if you drink slowly and you take short sips, it's more satisfying, meaning your thirst will be quenched more effectively and it's more decorous. It looks better. You look you appear to have better manners than a person that is running all over his face, all over his mouth. So it's really to sip the drink, sip the drink, and to sip the drink. Not like, like some people like do three slurps. So I saw that. You know, it's, it's, it's just to, to sip the drink, right? Just to sip the drink. But here Aisha, she said that <clears throat> the most beloved drinks to the Prophet ﷺ were those that were sweet, and cool, right? You like fruit juices, very cold water. Um, one of my one of my nutritionist friends tells me that drinking cold cold water is actually um, not the best. Drinking room temperature water is the best because cold cold water shocks the kidneys and shocks the system and everything, right? So by cool here, I think they don't, they don't mean refrigerated. It just mean, you know, nice and cool, nice and cool, cool drink of water. Let me see here. Bismillah. An Ibn Abbas in radiallahu anhu ma qala dakhaltu ma'a rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ana wa khalid ibn walid ala maymuna. فجاءتنا بإناء من لبن فشرب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنا على يمينه وخالد على شماله قال لي الشربة لك فإن شئت آثرت بها خالدا فقلت ما كنت لي أوثر على سؤرك أحدا ثم قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من أطعمه الله طعاما فليقل اللهم بارك لنا فيه واطعم واطعمنا خيرا من ومن سقاه الله عز وجل لبنا فليقل اللهم بارك لنا فيه وزدنا منه ثم قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس شيء يجزئ مكان الطعام والشراب غير اللبن <تصفيق> On the authority of Ibn Abbas, who reported Khalid ibn Walid and I, who were both very young at the time, went along with the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as he went to see Maymuna. She brought us a vessel full of milk. The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, drank from it. I was on his right side, and the Khalid was on his left. He said to me, the drink is yours, but if you want, you can give some, you can give preference to Khalid. You can give him some. So the prophet, I, so the, the jar of milk is there, or the, the vessel, the, you know, whatever they were drinking out of. The prophet, he drank from some, and then he left it, and he said to Ibn Abbas, this is yours. But if you want, you can give it to Khalid. I said, I am not about to give up your leftovers to anybody else. Meaning like, no, I'm taking this. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not, I'm sorry, Khalid, but I'm not, you can't have this one, you know, right? The Messenger of Allah, alayhi sallam, wa sallam, said, the one whom Allah gives food should say, oh Allah, bless us in it and give us to eat from what is better than it. And the one to whom Allah gives a drink of milk should say, O oh Allah, bless us in it and increase us in it. Then he said, the messenger of Allah, wasalam, said, there's nothing that takes the place of food and drink 
besides milk. So here, um, the Prophet ﷺ said that anyone that Allah gives food to, should say, Allahum at'imna, wa at'imna, uh, 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 at'imna minhu, wa at'imna khayrun minhu. Oh Allah, allow us to eat from it and give us that which is better than it. Meaning in Jannah, right? Because of course in Jannah we are given things that resemble things that we've had before, but their properties are different. So it's, it's, it's food, but not food like you've, eaten, you've ever eaten before, but enough to know what it is, right? Um, <clears throat> then you see in this uh, Ibn Abbas, not being selfish, but the su'ar of the Prophet ﷺ, the leftovers of the Prophet ﷺ, he's not giving them up, right? He's not giving them up. Right? And here, of course, is another um, example of the idea of tabarruk or tabarruk, of tabarruk or tabarruk that the Prophet وسلم, eating something or making use of something or something coming into contact with him, it acquires a kind of barakah through its contact with him. So for Ibn Abbas, he said, look, this was milk that the Prophet وسلم, drank from that he didn't finish. I am not giving this to anybody. I'm drinking from this, right? I'm drinking from this. The wudu that the Prophet ﷺ would make, the wadu, the water that would come from the wudu, they would take it and they would rub it on themselves, right? They would drink it, right? They believe, they would take it and put it on their ailments, right? These are not um, some kind of newfangled, um, um, uh, cultish practices. These were things that the, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ engaged in. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he says, uh, nothing takes the place of food and drink except milk. That for them, milk itself was a meal. That was an entire, like, if somebody said, what are you having for dinner? It was an acceptable answer to say, milk. I'm having milk for dinner. Right, milk, right? The milk was seen kind of as a food and a drink. <clears throat> just, just, just a little under the weather, inshallah. Nobody? It's okay, it's okay, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Babu ma jaa fi sifati shurbi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What has been narrated concerning the description of the manner in which the Prophet ﷺ would drink? عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم شرب من زمزم وهو قائم. On the authority of Ibn Abbas, who reported the Prophet ﷺ drank zamzam water. While he was standing, oh no, what about the guy who goes like this? Hold on. No, no, but no, no, no. <laughs> in earnestness, it was the regular practice of the Prophet ﷺ to drink uh, while kneeling, while kneeling or while sitting, but he would do things like this in full view of people so that people would know this is not haram. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with taking a drink while standing, right? So Ibn Abbas is narrating here. For anyone wondering, I saw the Prophet ﷺ take a drink of water while he was standing. So you don't have to stop in the middle of a busy street right there on State Street, rush hour, everybody rushing to their lunch. You're coming out of CVS. You got a Dasani water. You have to bend down and stop. Son, son, hold on, son. Okay, let's keep walking. You, you don't have to do that. You can just take the drink on as you're walking. It's okay. It's okay. عن عمر ابن شعيب عن أبيه عن جده قال رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يشرب قائما وقاعدا On the authority of Amr ibn Shu'ib, on the authority of his father, on the authority of his grandfather, who reported, 
I saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam drink while standing and drink while sitting. Man, what is that guy going to do, man? The guy who's, what's he going to do? <laughs> it's like, come on, man, that's, that's like half of his deed right there, man. You know, that's half of his deed. I drink while I'm kneeling down. SubhanAllah. On the authority, oh, عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما قال سقيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من زمزمة فشرب منه وهو قائم On the authority of Ibn Abbas who reported, I gave the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم some زمزم water and he drank it, and he drank it while he was standing. قال oh عن ال نزال ابن سبرا قال أوتي علي رضي الله عنه بكوز من ماء وهو في وهو في الرحبة فأخذ منه كفا فعسل يديه ومضمض واستنشق ومسح وجهه وذراعيه ورأسه ثم شرب وهو قائم ثم قال هذا وضوء من لم يحدث هكذا رأيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فعلى <coughs> on the authority of Nazal ibn Sabra who reported a clay jug of water was brought to Ali while he was in the courtyard he took a handful of water from it and washed his hands then he rinsed his mouth cleared his nose and wiped his face arms and head then he drank the remaining water while standing and said, this is the purification of one who has not voided his ritual purity. This is how I saw the messenger of Allah do it. So you notice he didn't mention the feet, right? So he says in this hadith, if you are making a wudu on top of your wudu, a wudu of fadl, men lam yuhdith wudu'a, who has not broken his wudu, meaning like, Say you really have wudu, but you just want the, the spiritual benefit of making like extra, like making extra wudu, uh, or maybe you're angry and you're making wudu to, to help your anger to subside. You don't have to include the feet, right? Ali said here, this is the wudu of someone that has not broken their wudu, right? So that he washed his hands, he washed his face, he wiped his head, he washed his arms to the, the elbow, he cleared his mouth, he cleared his nose, and then what was left, he drank. So they mentioned that he drank it as opposed to washing his feet. He could have used it to wash his feet, but he said, no, I, I, he drank it. The person was startled by this, like, you drank the water instead of washing your feet. And he explained, no, no, this is the wudu of someone that still has wudu. Right. This is the wudu of somebody that is, 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 that is in a state of wudu. This is what I saw the Prophet do, alayhi salatu wasalam. Right. That, that end part is like trump card. Like, in the, like, it's like, what? This is what, hakada fa'ala Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wasalam. What can you say to that? It's over. It's over. This is what I saw the Prophet do, alayhi salatu wasalam. <clears throat> عن أنس ابن مالك رضي الله عنه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يستن كان يتنفس في الإناء ثلاثا إذا شرب ويقول هو أمرأ وأروى When the Prophet uh, on the authority of Anas ibn Malik who reported when the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام would drink from a cup he would stop three times and he would say, this is more thirst quenching and more enjoyable. So that's, that's the three steps. He would, stop, he would stop three times. He would stop to catch his breath three times. Right, he wouldn't just, you know, chug a lug, right? All the way down, drink her now, drink her, you know. Funny thing, when I, when I was a kid, my grandmother, Allah Yerhamuha, she had a great love for Pepsi Cola. 
if, if any of you were coming to visit my grandma and you wanted to get on her good side, I would just say, bring a two liter of Pepsi. You're good. I would tell people that. Just bring a two liter of Pepsi. She's going to like you forever. My grandmother loved Pepsi. And we always had a 24 can. Like I drank so much soda as a kid. The fact that I don't drink soda now, I probably, ugh. man, I used to drink Pepsi like water. I mean, I would sometimes wake up first thing in the morning, Pepsi. Right? Now, Pepsi more than Coke. I never liked Coca-Cola. Some people say they don't even taste that different. Coke had more, had more of a lemon. There was something lemony in Coca-Cola that I didn't, I didn't like. Pepsi was like straight cola. <laughs> it was like, you know, and when you drank Pepsi, it used to burn your throat a little bit. Like, you know, if you, if you, kept, if you, kept, if you kept going, that, that, that the carbonation would burn your throat a little bit. I used to say, I bet I can drink a whole one liter of Pepsi on one sip, on one gulp. I, I used to take it, and it's coming out my mouth, it's coming up to my shirt. <laughs> it was just, it was just silly. My throat would be burning, my eyes would be watering, and it just, a, just a competition in greed. You know, sometimes I think it will be things like that. When they look back and they talk about the decadence of our society, I keep thinking that they could talk about some of these wars, but they may just show like a hot dog eating contest. They'd be like, this is, this is, this was the depth to which they sank. <laughs> and they just competed with each other eating hot dogs. You know, you know? <laughs> you know they're talking like 200 years from now, they say, you know, that was a dark time for humanity. Look at this. They show the tape of a hot dog eating contest. It's just like, look at the, look at the excess. Look at the, look at the animalistic tendency. I mean, this is disgusting. I mean, look at these people, man. And, 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 and you know, we'll be like in the audience cheering, go, 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 go. Stuck the law to me. Like, but the Prophet ﷺ was very, you know, things that did not appear mannerable. There's nothing about the Prophet ﷺ that we could read as pretentious. He wasn't a pretentious person. But things that really struck him as no. <laughs> you know, like he had that sense that, that if he saw somebody doing something that was like, no, right? And drinking in one gulp or breathing in the vessel or uh, the water running off the side of someone's face, that, that, that just stood out to him as like, no, no, that's not, uh, that's, that's, that's not, you, 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 should, you, should, you should take care to present yourself in a more mannerable and dignified way, right? <clears throat> no, subhanAllah. عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا شرب تنفس مرتين. When the on the authority of Ibn Abbas reported when the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام would drink, he would pause to breathe two times. He would stop stop and breathe. It wouldn't just no no one gulp all going down at the same time, right? عن عبد الرحمن ابن أبي عمرا عن جدته كبشة قالت دخل علي النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فشرب من في قربة معلقة قائما فقمت إلى فقمت إلى فيها فقطع فقطعت on the authority of Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Amra, on the authority of his grandmother, Kebsha. You see, too, in, in these hadith, um, lots of women narrators. Lots of women narrators. And, you know, although women were active in all of the areas of Islamic studies, hadith was the place that they probably had the biggest impact and biggest influence, right? So this is a, a hadith narrated on the authority of uh, a woman named Kebsha who reported, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu came to see me. 
He drank from the mouthpiece of a suspended leather water skin while standing. I stood up and cut off the mouthpiece of the water skin. So I don't know. So this, this woman, not in the family of the Prophet, just one of his companions, which we also see, he visited the female companions to check on them, to make sure that they were well, to see how they were doing. They were not in any way second-class members of that community. He wanted to um, talk to them, see what they needed. Uh, there was a special class that the Prophet ﷺ had for women. So Kabshah said that he came to visit me, right? Just to inquire about me. There was a water skin that was hanging up. He took some of the water. After he left, I cut off the mouthpiece of it and I kept it as like a, like a memento, like, you know, his mouth touched this, right? Like his mouth touched this, so she cut it off and kept it, right? So some of that, whenever I see stuff like that, it reminds me that, you know, some of the celebrity culture that we see people engaged in is actually quite natural. It's just that they are behaving this way toward people who are unworthy of that kind of adulation, right? But it's actually quite natural to like want a glove that Michael Jackson's hand was in, like people bidding millions of dollars for a sequin glove that anybody could make. You could, anybody could get a white glove, right? And adorn it with sequins. What makes that glove that Sotheby's is auctioning so significant. It's because the hand of MJ was in the glove, right? You know, or the first Jordans that Michael Jordan ever wore just auctioned for like $2 million or something like that. And these are just like sweaty sneakers that a professional athlete played in, but somebody thought that they were worth $2 million. Right? So we can look at that and say those stupid people. Or you can look and say, no, it's actually quite natural that people who are celebrated and esteemed, we love to have things that have touched them or that are associated with them. Or, you know, I can think of a few people like, that I have like as heroes that if somebody gave me a memento uh, or gave me a personal item of theirs, I would keep it. I, would, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, this is, this is meaningless. And somebody, if I like, obtain like Malcolm X's glasses or something like that. I would, I would like, you know, I would, that would be a great, that would be a great parlor trick. You know, people sitting around, you want to see something cool? They're like, they're just some old horn rim glasses. No, those are Malcolm X's glasses. Now, in fact, as a brother, um, I did his wedding. Oh man, I, I, I gotta find this thing. I did his wedding. And um, he offered me a signed, like, pamphlet, like what, what they say about Muhammad, pamphlet, that Muhammad Ali, that Muhammad Ali signed, right? And it was authenticated, and it was in this, like, like heavy laminate plastic, and he said, I want you to have this. Now, the reason it was cool to me was that Muhammad Ali used to carry these pamphlets. And when people asked him for autographs, he would autograph the pamphlet, right? And they said, why do you do that? He said, because if my autograph is on it, they won't throw it away. SubhanAllah, like, so, so, because imagine if someone just gives you a pamphlet and you're not interested in it, you just take it, oh, I don't, I don't wanna know about that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a religious seeker or anything, or maybe I'm, I'm Christian, I'm quite happy with that. But if you are a fan of Muhammad Ali, Right, he gives you something with his autograph on it. You're certainly going to keep it. So what he would give is like, you know, little pamphlets about Islam, pamphlets about the Prophet Ali, you know, and he would put his autograph on those. And he said, well, if my autograph is on it, I know they won't throw it away. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. So here we see that same impulse, but it's toward one who is absolutely worthy of that kind of um, esteem, right? She said the Prophet Ali, now notice, the prophet didn't tell anyone to do this. He didn't tell her, like, he took the drink and he said, my mouth was on that. You might want to keep it. Salam alaikum. <laughs> that, that, would be, that would be rather 
bizarre. And so it's this. Here, these dates are half eaten. You try, you take them. You know, no. She said that he put his mouth on it, and after he departed, I cut it off and I kept it as like a, a souvenir of some kind, right? That the Prophet ﷺ had come to visit me and he even drank from my water skin that was hanging. He, he put his mouth on it and he drank from it. And that was you know, a great uh, badge of pride for Kepsha, for that woman. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العاصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل الحق وتواصل الصبر آمين يا رب العالمين جزاك الله كل خير ما وقف زاشي under the weather so I'm gonna rush home إن شاء الله is there anywhere I, can, anywhere I can get a good cup of soup downtown? No? No. Yeah. Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe like Panera. Yep. Someone needs to open up a soup shop like that. Thank you. So, I'll take a